story of how I came to possess these journals is I got them from my grandpa. My grandpa was visiting um, his cousin. His cousin was Frank Starbuck. He was visiting Frank, and Frank was dying. And this, Grandpa knew this was probably the, the last time that he was going to go see him. This was in the 19, early 1970s. I believe it was 1971 in Shingle Springs. And Grandpa went in to visit Frank. And during the course of the conversation, Frank said, Elmer, I want you to go out and dig underneath that big tree out there. And he pointed to a tree on his property. And, you know, Grandpa, not wanting to upset this man on his deathbed, said, okay, you know, so he took a shovel and he went out and started digging. And he was digging for a while. And then pretty soon, he hit metal. And what he hit was with a carbine can. And so he brought it up from the earth. And um, it had a, like a sealed, um, there's a picture of it in the book. In, in the book. But um, it had like a, a lid that, went down into it, so it was pretty well sealed. So he brought it up, he opened it up, and there were 69 journals that had been written by James Russell. So, um, you know, we're very thankful that Frank, on his dying bed, told us where these journals were. We always, the family had always known these journals had been recorded, but no one knew what had happened to them. My primary documentation on this story of James Russell's life, who's my great-great-grandfather, comes from those journals where he did make the entries every day. I brought two of the journals up here, so you can kind of see them. And then um, other than using the journals for my documentation, what I use is newspapers. So when he goes and he talks about some incident happening, I can go to a newspaper and see, oh, yeah, what happened? And then kind of expand on that incident, you know, to add a little flavor to the story. And then legal documents. I have a couple legal documents up here. One is um, the court records for when there was a shooting. So I'll, I'll talk real briefly about that. And then the other legal document that I brought is the um, coroner's file, coroner's records when um, Frank Russell was killed, and I'll talk about that. I also brought copies of, or not copies, but documents that I transcribed. One is of the log of the ship that James Russell came on. I've been really lucky in that I found two logs that were kept on the ship. One was by the actual captain of the ship. Basically talks about the weather, how many miles they made that day. And then the other one is um, recorded by the secretary of the mining company. It was called the Hope Mining Company. And that's very flavorful. It talks about what they eat, what they were doing on the ship. Um, just very, very flavorful for, you know, information for people for documentation. This is a map. This is a map that's in Bill and Carp's book, but I just brought it here to show you that, like, this is the loop, the Deer Valley loop, and so I kind of marked some places. So this is where we are here, and over here is where um, the Russells lived. So it's kind of like the other side of the loop. And then scales. Um, and then I also have in here... these little scales that he could put in his pocket when he was down at the claim mining. So that's what these are. Kind of old and broken and there's little weights in there. And so. This is a candlestick um, for lighting when they would mine at night. So they would hammer this into the tree, have a candle in it, and they could light it and then they could see. Oh my God. So. And when the weather was um, real rainy, and they had a lot of opportunity to mine in the creeks, they did go out and mine a lot during the night. So anyways, afterwards, if you feel free to come up here and look at you know, some of the stuff that they brought. So where I'm going to start is, is where he was born. I'll tell you a little bit about his early life. Um, he was born in Nantucket, Massachusetts, which is south of Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket. He was born May 30th, 1830. Adventure was in his blood. For generations, his family had been whalers. Nantucket, for many years, almost 100 years, was the whaling capital of the world. So it was expected that the young men would go into that occupation. That's all they knew on the island. That's all they, the whale oil that was brought back was processed there. The blubber was processed on the island. So it was actually a little bit, not real prosperous, but they did very well on the island. In the, up until about 1840. 
and it was expected that the young men would follow those occupations. Um, about 1840, a couple things happened. One was um, as whaling became more, um, well, they, they, were, they were actually killing all the whales is what they were doing. So they had to go further and further from Nantucket to find whales. So the whaling trips took up to like four or five years. They would come all the way around the Horn up into the um, Pacific, where originally they were just going around Nantucket and then up into the North Atlantic. They just had to go further and further as the whale population became depleted. So that happened. That made it a little rougher. The other thing was um, in the 1840s, kerosene was developed. So kerosene was used to light homes. So they had no use or they didn't have as much use for whale oil. So that was hurting the economy. So in the event of all that, they had a fire. Just like you know, we all have heard about the fires out west during the gold rush period in Nantucket, they had a fire. It virtually destroyed the town. Um, I found newspaper articles where they were begging for clothes, they were begging for food because they were so offshore that it was hard for them to, to get things to um, actually start supplying so that they could rebuild the island. So it was pretty rough in the 1840s. So that was, you know, he was you know, between 10 and 12, 13, 14 years old. And then what happened in the 1840s, you guys tell me? Gold was discovered. <laughs> Gold was discovered. So it was more than enough to spark his imagination. So he d made some decisions and decided that, hey, that's looking pretty good. You know, they're out there in California, they're just picking up nuggets off of the ground. So. <laughs> This is what they said in Nantucket about what was happening, because actually Nantucket was no different than anywhere else. The towns were just becoming depleted of the male population because they were all headed west. So in the Nantucket newspaper it said, what is Nantucket coming to? That depends almost entirely, we say, about Nantucket herself. We cannot prevent our young men from going to California, and indeed, why should we? If there is wealth to be had, they should, not, they should try to get their share of it as well as others. If they can only obtain a million or two million of dollars, it will not only help them, but indirectly it would help us here on the island. For we hear not a doubt expressed that two thirds of them will return to Nantucket after an absence of one, two, or three years. Their wives, their children, their friends, and all their family are here. This is their home. Whether the adventures are successful or not, nearly all are agreed that we shall have them among us again. Those who return rich will want some business in which to invest their wealth. And those who return poor will want something to do to earn their bread. This gold digging is not calculated to be a permanent business. Few who go to California have the least idea that they shall remain there. They no more intend to make that country their home than our well men do the decks of our ships. And then the article optimistically concluded, it may be rather dull here this season and the next, but what of that? If we will only keep up our spirits and keep up our business, all will yet be well. In the course of 12 months, the gold will begin to come in, and in two, three, or four years, the great body of our gold diggers themselves will be back, ready, if we have kept the house in order during their absence, to take hold and help to enlarge and beautify it. In reality, what happened to Nantucket is two-thirds of the population left for California. If you do research on, um, in early newspapers, especially in the San Francisco area, because there were a lot of whaling captains and a lot of sea people that settled there from Nantucket, you find Nantucket mentioned just numerous, numerous, numerous times. So hearing of the gold being found, it sparked 19-year-old Russell's imagination. In the late summer of 1849, he signed on to the Hope Mining Company boarded a converted whaler that was captained by his uncle, whaler, master captain Uriah Russell, and with a cargo of lumber, oil, coal, and 45 other adventures, he set out on a 183-day voyage around the Horn and into San Francisco Bay. August 22nd of 1849, the log of the ship Fanny reads, employed in getting the ship ready for sea, and the next day at noon took the anchor and stood out to sea bore south-southeast. The weather was clear, the winds moderate, and the sea calm as they moved out into the Atlantic. At the Azor Islands, 
the uh, ship attempted to dock because they were going to take on some fruit and vegetables. That's what they were hoping to do. But what happened was the authorities tried to quarantine the ship because there was an outbreak of cholera in New York. Well, in reality, they never, they never went to New York. They left, um, they went to, left Nantucket, went to Martha Vineyards, and then headed out to the Atlantic. But the authorities still wanted to quarantine them, and so what they did was during the night, they just um, escaped when people weren't watching it, yes. So they got away from that. And then they stopped in the Cape Verde Islands and took on water, fruit, and vegetables. So the log that I'm going to quote from is Christopher Capon's log, and he was the one that was the secretary of the mining company. And he said on September 25th, fine weather with light trade winds, steering south by south. Several porpoises about the ship, which created some excitement for those who had been used to them. They fitted their irons and captured and saved two fine ones, which when prepared by taking their skin or blubber off, were cooked and eaten with a relish. They were very nice, made into a savory meat, served with pork. The blubber was tried out, making two gallons of oil, because they were whalemen, remember, so they weren't going to let that oil go to waste. On the 22nd of September, which was Saturday, as all our company were seated at the table of, at, for supper, Brother John B. Coffin went to his room and brought out a bag of letters. This is like probably one of my favorite entries because I can so much picture this happening. The letters were given to him before we left home from the wives of this company to be distributed when we were one month out, by which we were much surprised and highly delighted to hear from home. So you can kind of picture them all sitting around and they get these letters from their wives. On they sailed with clear skies, light winds. One person is recorded as becoming ill and died during the sailing. So Russell's journal entries re record, Brother John B. Coffin seems worse, so much so that Captain Dona and myself spend all of our time to wait on him, each half of the night and day. Captain and Dona continued their dedication to the care of the fatally ill man. October 22nd. Brother John B. Coffin seems worse, though we are doing all we can, and everyone in the ship feels a deep interest in his welfare. Kind of remember that these people were all from Nantucket, the people that were on the ship. So they're all friends. Some of, a lot of them are related. They're cousins, their aunts, or their aunt, not aunts, their uncles. So I'm sure they felt this illness. On October 24th, Brother John in the morning seemed worse. So much so that I gave him up, thinking he could not live through the day. He seemed convulsed and would spring up from his bed so sudden that we had to stand by him all the time to keep him on the bed. He did not seem to notice us, for he was delirious. We consulted one another and did for him all that we could to make him com comfortable. And in the morning, he was looked to be struck with death and convulsed very much. At half past nine in the evening, he expired, seemingly very easy and without much of a struggle being insensible. We were probably 30 miles north of the line when he died, and he was buried 10 or 12 miles south of the line. He being an odd fellow, and there being a number of that fraternal order on board, it was thought appropriate to use that religious form of ceremony and adopted by that order. And accordingly, he was buried on Thursday, the 25th of October at 9 o'clock in the morning. It was a very gloomy day when we buried our brother John at sea. The winds pushed the ship to rougher seas and cooler temperatures and into the whaling grounds. The passengers, having backgrounds and knowledge of the trials of sailing around Cape Horn, knew a challenge was to be had. They encountered strong winds, heavy seas, and stormy currents when they were going around the Horn. Haven described, the weather has been very rough and some of the sheeping is off around the lumber post. She leaks but little, but we do pump more today than we have before it on the whole trip. And finally, he declared, we are now handsomely around Cape Horn and in the Pacific Ocean, and only want a good wind to carry us along. I'm sure they could see like the end was in sight now. On the 125th day at sea, the entry reads, first part of this 24 hours commencing at midnight, light to fair winds, all sails set. At 6 a.m., off Michelin in sight. 10 a.m., Indian head in sight. Middle and latter part, good breeze from southeast, steering north by east. Saw one humpback whale and plenty of booning. 
which are a very large bird, and follow the ship, and feed on the grease and offal that is thrown overboard. Some of them have been caught on board by baiting a fish hook with pork. They measured from tip to tip of their wings when spread on deck, 10 feet, 2 inches. Passengers were now getting their clothes, boots, and hats ready for it going ashore at Valparaiso, Chile. They encountered improved sailing and were able to go ashore at Chile from December 29th to January 3rd. And I didn't include any of those entries, but there's some great descriptions of what um, Valparaiso was like and what they did. Navigating along the coast, the passengers were observed, all hands busily at work, building a boat and scow, making tents and tarring, and getting up our rigging. In addition, they sharpened their pixes, their axes, they mended clothes, and they checked and rechecked their supplies and examined maps, maps of the gold area. Sailing was good on California's coast, and the ship anchored in San Francisco on February 22, 1850. There's also descriptions in the journal they were met when they, when they got onto shore by many, many of their Nantucket friends. So that was a nice welcome for them. Russell's ship, well, shipmate, John Morsey, wrote home to Nantucket. It certainly is an astonishing, novel, and wonderful place. The mines yield as richly as ever. I believe that an industrious man can do well. He may not become a millionaire or even get rich in a year, but will scrape together more money in a year than he could possibly obtain with the same exertion elsewhere. Three of our Nantucket men returned from the southern mines a few days ago, who had worked in company and after paying all their expenses, divided $1,800 apiece. Must have looked pretty good to these guys. Others of our townsmen have done well at the mines. Indeed, so far as I have been able to learn, those from Nantucket, whether as miners, mechanics, laborers, or traders, have met with a full average of prosperity. The one thing I will say in closing is that I do not regret being here to try my luck. Russell settled in an area known as Rincon Hill. It was known to be an exclusive area of sea captains from Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. And he spent four months there. And what he did when he first landed was, um, you've all seen the pictures of San Francisco Bay and how crowded it was with all the ships that were coming in, because a lot of them were just deserted. And so there was just ship after ship after ship. And what he did was, as the ships have to, had to come in and stay further away from the land, because there were so many ships parked there, or docked there, that um, they had boats and they would go, he had a scow and he would go out to the boat and he would bring um, people onto shore and bring all their luggage or whatever they had, their sea chests, I guess, in. And so that's how he's made, made his money for the first four months he was in California. He was in San Francisco and he helped fight the devastating fire of May 4, 1850. And it was not long before he gathered his supplies and headed for the latest gold strikes on the Yuba River. And when he got to the Yuba River, he met up with Charles Frederick Macy and Roland Hussey Macy. The, the three of them were cousins, Russell and the two Macy's, obviously all from Nantucket. While Russell panned for gold in the river, the Macy's set up a store. And what happened to them was um, they ordered a bunch of supplies for their store from the East Coast. Well, it took a long time for it to get to California after they ordered it, like probably over a year. By the time they ordered it, got back there, came back out. So by the time um, the goods all got here to sell, there was nobody to sell them to because people had left the area. There was a drought and people had left the area. So um, Charles Frederick went to spend a little while in um, Nevada City, the Grass Valley area. He ended up then going to Iowa Hill in Placer County and he lived out his life there. That's where he had his family and, and he's buried there. R. H. Macy, Roland Hussey Macy is a little more interesting story. He um, left the area up there and went to San Francisco. Stayed there for a little while in the um, Rincon Hill area with some of the sea captains and then decided he wanted to go back home. So he went back home, he went back to Nantucket and he started a store again. He went bankrupt again. <laughs> so then he thought, well, I'm gonna go on to the mainland. So he came on to the mainland 
in Massachusetts, and he had two more stores. Both of those stores went bankrupt, so his luck was not very good. He wanted to give it one more try, so he went to New York City. He established Macy's Department Store. Oh. So of all the guys, he's probably the one that was the winner in the whole thing. Oh As for Russell, he decided to head for Sacramento. And it was in the fall of 1850 when he saw his first lynching. And what he observed was, and these events were easy to track because as he aged, when he was 98, 99, and 100, years old, he's interviewed in a lot of newspapers that he would recall these events. So then I could research them and think, oh yeah, he was actually there. Some of them, his information was a little bit different than what I found in my research, but basically the stories were the same. So this lynching he saw was a man named Roe. And um, Roe shot a man during a game of Pharaoh in Sacramento. And he was quickly um, taken into custody by the law enforcement officers and placed in jail. But as it was with the rough and tough judicial system of the West, um, about 2,000 people, as was quoted in the Sacramento um, Daily Union, broke into the jail with, with what they did was um, the coverings of the sidewalks had posts. They took the posts down, they ran into the jail, got the guy out, and um, they hung him. Um. And they, it, the estimated number of people that were there observing it was 2,000. So Russell, he, just, he thought, oh my gosh, judicial, West, West, judicial system in the West is pretty bad. So um, it was about this time that the ship arrived with bringing word that California had been admitted to statehood. And he liked to recall about this celebration. There were bonfires on the levee. There were fireworks shot in the sky. And there was a parade. But the problem with the parade was everybody was so excited that California was admitted to statehood, there was no one to actually watch it. They were all marching in it. So they just marched around the streets of this. <laughs> and so then, of course, he was in Sacramento when cholera struck, because the ship that brought the word of California being admitted to statehood is the one that brought the passenger that had cholera that exposed Sacramento to all the cholera. So during the epidemic, 150 people died in a single day. 17 physicians died while treating the ill. Mm -hmm. The mayor of Sacramento, Harden Bigelow, fled the city for San Francisco, only to die there of the cholera, which he had already been exposed. 80% of Sacramento's population fled the city. Russell decided it was time to leave. Arriving in Placerville, he met up with some more Nantucketers, James Chase and Benjamin Gardner. And along mm -hmm. with a man from Connecticut named William B. House, they headed to Coloma. They found it overcrowded, and there wasn't much gold that being found. They quickly moved on and settled and prospected on Sweetwater Creek. Life in the diggings was not easy. The gold was not easily found. Russell's days were spent prospecting, wheeling dirt, throwing dirt, washing dirt, and sluicing dirt. Mm -hmm. The days were long, the work hard, and the earnings were very meager. Some journal entries read, Washed some this morning and night, got about 25 cents. And then in big capital letters, he's got B-U-L-L-Y, bully. <laughs> Towing some this morning and rocking between, got nothing as usual. But there were some good times recorded as well. Got one piece of $17. Ground sluicing on the hill almost all day, picked up $9 and one piece of $8. Rocking some on the hill, got $18.25 and then made a big strike. The weather was especially important to the miners, and by far it's the most frequent entry in his journal's documents, whatever the weather was like. Without rain, there was no water in the creeks and rivers. After one lengthy storm, he recorded, rocking all day up the ravine, got $21.50, one whole year's worth. Mm -hmm. On another occasion, rain merrily last night, water everywhere this morning, hallelujah. An especially joyous entry reads, rocking all day up the ravine, got three pieces of six ounces. That was a really good day. Didn't quit in time to pan out. Beautiful clear weather, but cool with heavy frost and ice. New Year's Eve of December, New Year's Eve, December 21st, 1867. He recorded rain all last night and all day today. At work, washing on the hill. Picked up one piece of six and a half ounces. 
Good sign for more rain, 1867 is going out howling. While mining occupied the majority of the miners' time, they enjoyed dances and balls where midnight suppers were served, community dinners, and singing schools. Russell was a happy regular attendant in the singing school. One entry reads, singing school this evening. One entry reads, wrote to home for songs to share with my singing school. He played the harmonica, and Andrew Hare, with his banjo and others with their instruments, made quite a group. Ella Hare, years later, would recall, the singing schools conducted at the Sunrise House on the road between Folsom and Coloma. She recalled there being about 40 members who attended regularly scheduled gatherings. She said, after they had sufficient instruction, they gave an entertainment and a dance, charging $3. The miners planted and maintained gardens and vineyards, had some orchards, and the, when the mining was not productive, Russell worked in the vineyards of James Skinner and Peter Collier. Picking grapes for Mr. Collier only got in half a day, quick to let it rain. Picking grapes all day for Mr. Collier, cold and not so bad. At work all day for Mr. Skinner, picking grapes, my back's aching. Working again for Mr. Skinner. In the later years after his children were born, his children actually worked with him in the vineyards, and his wife at times also is recorded to having worked in the vineyards. They hunted deer, turkeys, and geese, and a favorite pastime was gathering the blackberries along the creek. The best blackberry pudding yet, he wrote. While making the most of hard work and sharing the good times, Russell determined there was one thing missing from his life. As women became more frequent, Russell decided he would like a companion too. So in 1860, he traveled back to Nantucket to see his widowed mother and two sisters. And it was during this four month trip that he met Ellen Brooks. This is Ellen, right here, looking quite distinguished. Um, he enjoyed his visits with family and friends and spending time and getting to know Miss Brooks. He assessed the economy and decided to return to California with newly found determination and hopes that Ellen joined him in the West. So what had happened was, you know, I talked about Nantucket's um, economy being very poor, and in reality, Nantucket's economy did not actually bounce back until the 1880s, and in the 1880s, it became an artist colony. So that's what it actually decided, became more productive, and then became, you know, the obviously very expensive place it is today. So, um, so times were sometimes tough. The miners joined forces with New Englander, when New Englander Charles Gay disappeared near Salmon Falls. And on June 27, 1861, Russell wrote, heard of the disappearance of Charles Gay. We are all looking for him, hope it ends well. The miners quickly divided into groups and searched the area for any traces of the missing man. 24 hours later, a somber Russell recorded, found Charles Gay's body and buried it. The Indians taken off to Placerville by the sheriff. The following account of the murder and, and taken from a California newspaper sent to us by a correspondent at Salmon Falls, California. And then it says, Gay was the brother to Alphonse Gay of this city and the wife of Samuel Mason, a reporter for the Boston Herald. He had gone to California nine years ago and was preparing to come back to knowing us. We give this account. There was a most diabolical murder committed in this township on Wednesday the 26th. Near the hotel of J. Taylor, one Charles Gay left home in the morning to work his claim, taking his dinner in a new tin bucket, but did not return at night. On the morning of Thursday, his fellow neighbors became uneasy about him and went to his claim to look for him and found his shovel battered up and bent, his pick handle broken as though done with a shovel, and his bucket was gone. They immediately raised others to search for him. Three Indians were found and confessed to the murder and returned. They showed where they hid the body. They had carried it to the top of a chaparral mountain, then threw it down, dragged it by his feet some 50 yards over rocks and stones, down the opposite side, tearing the clothes and the skin off the poor man's back. They say they shot him twice in the back, 
and struck him with the shovel till they had cut up his head in a shocking manner. <clears throat> he tried to defend himself with the pick. They then struck the pick into his head several times. He still breathed and groaned. They then, with a knife, cut him open from his breast to below his stable, leaving his bowels protruding from the gut. In the course of the hunt, miners turned searchers found Gay's hat, socks, and purse crowded into a squirrel hall near an Indian encampment, and the camp was deserted by what was believed the Indians. The Indians' cooking utensils remained there as though they had left in a hurry. It was learned that the Indians had gone towards Mormon Island stained with blood and carrying the bucket. The citizens then went in search of the Indians and found a large company near the island. The people then called Justice Berry and held an inquest and brought in a verdict in accordance with the above facts that Gay was murdered by Indians. Curly, Jim, and Little Jim, and Indian Dick, alias Bob. The citizens then by vote decided to hang him and were making preparations when the deputy sheriff and posse arrived from Placerville and demanded the prisoners. After much talk and argument, the officers were allowed to take them. The Indians were tried and convicted in Placerville three months later. Over 100 people gathered to witness the execution, including women, Catholic priests, and a dozen Indians on November 1st, 1861. The Weekly Butte Democrat wrote of the hanging the prisoners talked for some minutes, most fleeingly and earnestly, to the hanging witnesses, urging them to abstain from the use of whiskey and be good men and women. Jim, the younger one, said, let whiskey alone, boys. Whiskey is damn bad for white men and Indians all the same. See what it has brought to me, and he pointed to the gallows. The guilty Indians had the black caps placed over their heads. Their arms and legs were bound. And then the article concluded. They shook hands with the sheriff and others, and in a few moments, the trail fell. Their feet moved in slight struggle before being stilled. The bodies hung for 20 minutes, after which they were placed in coffins and delivered to the Indians who were in attendance. The Indians transferred the bodies to Gold Hill, where they were burned in the Indian tradition. Meanwhile, back at the, when he was killed, his friends had held a service to bury him, and they had collected money and erected a fence surrounding the burial site. In the triumphs and tragedies of life in the foothills, Russell followed national news of the Civil War and other political events through reading newspapers, telegraph messages, letters from home, and gathering at John Evans' store, where the residents gathered to exchange news. He wrote news of the Battle of Corinthian news of the Battle of New Orleans, and sometimes no news of importance from Dixie. And finally, the journal reads, news of the fall of Richmond and Petersburg, and then six days later, news of the surrender of Lee to Grant. We had quite a celebration. What the newspaper said about this at the time was, the legacy. The great rebellion is dead. It fell with a sudden crash, and nothing is left but the dust and debris. To the brave men of free America, we are indebted. The men of the North are returning to their homes, not with the sh shouts of victory. For every man fully understood the great social and political questions which were to be determined by defeat or victory. Such is the character of the men who are returning to leave their children and to generations who shall succeed them a priceless legacy. Freedom to man, freedom of thought, freedom of action, freedom of government, where every man stands as a peer and a sovereign, here alone in this land by divine right, unshackled and free. To their children will descend the arms which they fought the battles of victory, which the government has given them. The rifle and the sword will pres be preserved with religious care, and in years to come will be pointed out as the weapons of the crusaders of freedom who in the 19th century willed them with might and power to preserve the liberties of the great republic of the West. That was the Mountain Democrat. I thought that was pretty dramatic writing for the local paper. The celebrations of the end of the war quickly halted when on April 15, 1865, the Telegraph delivered the news of President Lincoln's assassination. 
Russell recorded, news of the assassination of President Lincoln and Secretary Seward, awful indeed. And the next day, add to Evans' store to get more particulars regarding the assassination. El Dorado County residents joined people nationwide in mourning. The Mount Democrat published tributes to the fallen president on April 22nd. Reading National Calamity, and in part it read, The nation mourns the chief in whom it placed unabounded confidence, for he is no more. Abraham Lincoln, chief magistrate of the United States, in the maturity of his manhood, the ripeness of his intellect, and the fullness of his fame, was assassinated in Washington City last Friday night. The article continued to describe the ceremonies for the dead president held in Placerville on April 19th. Public buildings, dwellings, hotels, stores, shops, in fact, every occupied house in the city was draped in mourning. From the different flight staffs drooped our national colors at half mast. Bells tolled, a solid dirge, our city was in mourning. Crape covered houses and people. Preceding the funeral ceremony, a procession was led by the Union Brass Band, a hearse and pallbearers, followed by military troops with arms, the judiciary, city, and county officers, fraternal organizations, and citizens on foot and in horses and in carriages. They meandered their way through the streets to the Methodist Episcopal Church. James Russell was there. He went in for the funeral that they were celebrating, they were having in Placerville. But it was as it was reported, and as he says in his journals, there was a very large crowd there. So he actually couldn't even get into the church. So he was one of the people that was outside the church during the ceremony. But during the ceremony, they joined um, in singing hymns, listened to orations about the about the president. Now, remember that Ellen Brooks that Russell met in 1860 when he went on uh, his little return trip to Nantucket to visit his mother and his sisters? Well, he corresponded with her for eight years. And in the summer of 1868, he began to prepare for another trip home to Nantucket. And if you look at these pictures of, of James Russell, he was always a little balding. I think it's like a trait that runs in our family. But um, he had a very much receding hairline. And so, um, right before he left in the journal, he's got this remedy, and it's called as a remedy to restore health, or to restore hair, I'm sorry. Um, and it says, one pint of alcohol, one gill tooth of arnica, three ounces of ammonia, one ounce of gum, gum camphor, and rub well. <laughs> so that's what he did. Then he went to San Francisco, and he bought a ticket, and he boarded the steamer Okorian for a trip home. <coughs> and in Nantucket, he visited friends and the woman he was now calling in his journals, Dear Ellen. And his journal entry <coughs> for November 21st reads, Ellen and myself were married this morning by the Reverend Mr. Davis, left soon after on the island steamer. They spent two days in New York City, shopping and enjoying the sights, and then they boarded the ship Henry Chacon for San Francisco. And you can tell on the, um, from the, in the journals when he's away from home, because instead of writing with ink, he writes with a, like lead. So you can definitely tell when he's not at home. So they spent pleasant days at sea, passing the time writing letters to friends and promenading on deck, reading books and writing in their journals. They arrived in the city by the bay on December 17th and left immediately for Sacramento and El Dorado County. Arriving in Sweetwater, El Dorado County Russell, dropped off his newly found wife at some friend's house, and then he went on to his shanty to prepare it for her. So I think he must have actually really gotten to know her because she was actually from a very prominent family, and she was used to you know a nice house with windows. It was a brick house with windows that overlooked the ocean, had a floor, and he brought her to Sweetwater. <laughs> and it was a shanty. It had no floor. It didn't have glass in the windows. It, it most likely did not, I don't know for sure, but it may not have had curtains in the window. So it was pretty rough. I think she was pretty shocked. She spent the night with her friend Annie Chase, who was actually also from Nantucket. He went home, tried to prepare, I guess, the house as best he could, and then he brought her the next day. She did, dedicated her first, uh, the only diary I have that she kept is the first year she was here. So I'm not sure what that indicates. I don't think there are any more journals that she wrote that I've been able to find within the family. So either she was like 
pretty depressed and didn't want to write, or she was so busy she didn't have time. So we'll just kind of leave it to our imaginations about her. But she dedicated her first months in the diggings to papering and painting the shanty, stuffing the mattresses with hay for comfort, and making a rag rug for the floor. She sketched pictures to hang on the walls and sent home to family. And she engaged her husband to build her a bookcase, a sink, and a table. Ellen's womanly touches transformed the small shanty into a comfortable residence. She took an active interest in Russell's mining activities. She made frequent trips to his claim. One entry says, this afternoon down on the claim, a few moments, then came up to Mr. Gardner's to see them fix some gold to sell. She cherished the time with the other women along the creek. She wrote, down to Mrs. Toby's today to a quilting. Mrs. Robbins, Mrs. White, Mrs. Chase, Mrs. Coates, Mrs. Skinner, Mrs. Zingrap, and Roffling, and myself there, men down in the evening. So the family's story about Ellen is that she was very unhappy when she came to El Dorado County. And she was actually preparing to leave um, and go back home, and then something happened, and I'm going to tell you about that now. So it was a good thing that happened, but I think she finally realized she was never going to go back home, and she never did go back home. On November 29, 1869, Ellen, quite unwell, nothing new yet, wrote a worried Russell. The next day, he joyfully proclaimed, baby born this morning at half past three after a hard night of it. They named the child Nettie. Nettie would marry Marcus Starbuck, who Starbuck Road is named for. Two more children were born to James and Ellen. Frank, born May 24, 1871, and Aggie, who's my great grandma, was born April 2, 1878. Russell actively participated in the upbringing of his children, and he constantly has recordings about the activities he does with them. He stayed with the children when Ellen took trips to town or visited with neighbors. He enjoyed reading to the girls and taking Frank with him to the claim. He proudly recorded walking each of his children to their first day of school. It was a school where he served four three-year terms as an elected trustee. His responsibilities as trustee included hiring and paying the schoolmistress, ordering books, maintaining the one-room schoolhouse by preparing the furniture and moving the furnishings when they needed to. He painted the blackboard, he built a fence, and chopped wood for the stove. He was paid $2 a day for his work. Ellen, having been a teacher in Nantucket, volunteered helping to tutor the young children in the school. There were tough times for many of those who came to Elder, Elder Atta County in hopes of finding riches. So I'm going to tell you about two incidences that happened. One is about Adam Lowry. Is that, that name ring a bell with people? Lotus? Yeah. Adam Lowry was actually from Lotus. Um, if you're going, you know where everybody knows where Lotus is. If you go by there and there's that big red, um, red brick building on the side of the road, that was uh, Adam Lowry. He had settled there in 1853 and opened a store. And he was a very successful man. When you look at the census records, I can't remember the actual value that he gives of his real estate and personal belongings, but it was very high for the times, like in the thousands of dollars. So, um, the Madden Democrat ran advertisements offering a $500 reward for the recovery of Adam Lowry of Uniontown. He resided along the Clomer Road, and he was last seen by his wife on the morning of April 12, 1880. He did not return home that afternoon. Friends and neighbors were worried, and through the month, rain fell as the search for the missing man continued. Russell recorded on April 20th, rain, 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 steady, and long continually for the past 36 hours, and the end is not yet in sight. No news of Lowry. While concern for Lowry grew, Russell and the miners returned to their search for gold. Pete and myself at work in the hill hand out six dollars. This is the 11th day of night of rain, and looks as if it might repeat itself tomorrow. The newspaper gave periodic updates on Lowry reporting. For some time prior to his disappearance, which occurred on the morning of April 12th, Mr. Lowry had acted strangely, and is believed he was partially deranged. Spring turned into summer, and it was the end of August when it was reported that the body of Lowry was found. The August 24th edition of the Sacramento Daily Union reported the bottom of A. Lowry, a well-known merchant at Uniontown, El Dorado County, committed suicide by drowning on the 12th of April, was found Friday afternoon near Jayhawk. 
The body was found two miles from the road near the bank of the river where the body had eventually, had, I'm sorry, evidently been thrown when the water was at its highest mark for the winter. Alerted to the discovery of the body, District Attorney Ingram traveled to Salmon Falls for a coroner's inquest. At the inquest, it was determined the body was unquestionably that of Mr. Lowry. Other ways to identify the dead man were reported in the Mountain Democrat, and it said the pantaloons he wore at the time of his disappearance were made from cloth taken out of his own store, and the remainder of the bolt was produced. <clears throat> Mrs. Lowry said, two of his front teeth were broken, and it was evident to the jury. Furthermore, Mrs. Lowry produced an undershirt, the exact counterpart of the one worn by the deceased at the time of his disappearance which was particularly made with buttons all the way down the front. And the inquest concluded that the death was a suicide. But I'm not sure about that, if that was the real story. Because further investigation and research of Adam Lowry found this to be the family story. And so I'm going to quote from what the family said, from San Francisco. And he allowed his customers to keep their money and valuables in it. And during the heyday of the Comstock, Comstock load, Lowry invested heavily in the gold and silver mines around Virginia City. Receiving a tip one day that a recent dip in mining stock values was due to recover and lead to extraordinary growth, Lowry decided to invest not only all his liquid assets, but the contents of the safe as well. He would not only make himself rich, but he would bring wealth to his friends and neighbors. Too, or so he believed. The stock never recovered its value, and it continued to decline until it became virtually worthless. Lowry rushed to Virginia City to investigate, and his darkest fears were realized. Back at Uniontown, shamed and remorseful, Lowry walked down to the river, carefully removed and folded his jacket, laid it softly on the river bank and walked into the turbulent waters of the river where he was pulled down river and drowned, or so it would appear. Or, the angry town people were pretty upset with him, so there's some speculation that they may have taken things into their own hands and put his body in the river. And then I found another story about that in this book, for California, which is actually about quilts made by women in California during the gold rush. One of um, his, Adam Lowry's wife's quilts is in the book. Okay, so it gives a little bio of the Lowry family, and then it says, in 1880, Adam committed suicide by drowning himself, himself in the American River, which ran through the back of his property. He was distraught over the theft of gold left in the safe at his store for the safekeeping by local miners. And his son-in-law was convicted and sent to prison for a crime of theft. So there are a few stories there. So, And I tried to look through old prison records on the internet to see if I could find his son-in-law, either in Folsom or San Quentin, and I found nothing. So I guess we'll probably never really know what happened to Adam Lowry. There were, as in, in the trials and tribulations of the gold rush, there were celebrations of the holidays, the 4th of July picnics. They were called the grandest and the glorious, and the enjoyment of Christmas Eve spent with family and friends. But illness was also introduced into the community, and the community would support, support other families as the children were struck down by the disease that moved through the foothills. While the Russians tended their own sick children, there were many young children who died. May 31st, Matthew Howard's child, Jimmy, died. June 15th, Henry Rothling's child died. August 15th, Hans Thompson's child died. Meanwhile, Russell's children were very sick also, all three of his children. And finally, he was able to record, thank God my children are better tonight. <clears throat> Mining comrades helped you care for their sick and dying neighbors. Russell's friend and neighbor, Nicholas Edwards, was sick for a very long time. And so I'm going to read you some of the journal entries that reflect the activities while uh, Nicholas Edwards was dying. On June 12th, down to see Edwards this afternoon. June 15th, watched with Edwards last night. The next night, down to Edwards afternoon. 
June 18th, down to Collier's, attending Edwards, going to stay with him tonight. June 19th, up with Edwards, all last night in company with Beecher. Doing no work today, down to Conrad's store after some strawberries for our sick, sick friend. So kind of keep in mind, you know, they didn't have um, sick leave. Every time they took away from the mines or from the creeks where they were doing some mining, they were losing money. But they were very dedicated to each other. While up at the store buying strawberries for his sick friend, he purchased the necessary ingredients for what he called a dysentery recipe. And this is what he wrote. Take equal parts of tincture of oatmeal, <coughs> red pepper, rhubarb, peppermint, and mix well. In case of diarrhea, take a dose of 10 to 20 drops in three or four teaspoonfuls of water. He mixed the medication and hoped the best for his 51-year-old 50 year friend writing sure to be a cure. Well, unfortunately for Edwards, it was not a sure cure. On June 22nd, going to watch with Edwards tonight. Not at work today, down to see Edwards after dinner on the 24th. On the 25th, attending Edwards part of the afternoon. On the 26th, going to set up with Edwards tonight. On the 27th, watched with Edwards last night, probably the last, I will have to, as he is very low. On the 28th, Edwards died this evening at 9 o'clock. We buried our friend at 4 o'clock in the Jayhawk Burying Ground, a large attendance, a very good service at the grave by the Reverend Mr. Pierce of Placerville. Peace to my friend's soul. That was on the 29th. Russell continued his allegiance to his dead friend by meeting with others to determine what to do with his personal effects. On June 30th, at work this morning, wheeling off dirt, out to Green Valley Schoolhouse afternoon, down to Collier's this evening to a private meeting concerning the late Mr. Edwards. On July 1st, commenced work this morning, but did not work long, helped bring Edwards' belongings up to his cabin. And on July 6th, he wrote, at work this morning, selling Edwards' claim and cabin, and so forth. On July 7th, Russell wrote to Edwards' brother, he wrote, wrote to John tonight concerning Edward's goods. In the letter, he explained the circumstances of the death and enclosed the money from the sale of Edward's belongings. So it's a little different than those stories that you hear about how the miners were mining and somebody died and they just kept mining, you know? It didn't always happen that way. As Russell's early day friends began to return home in the east or be buried in the local cemetery, he continued to look for the good prospect. Still prospecting all day for quartz pockets, succeeding in finding one late in the afternoon. Bids to be a good one. And a good one it was. Three days later, he reported that four and a half ounces of gold. But all too often, the journal entries reflect disappointment. Washing this morning got about nothing. The gold dust and nuggets, ever more elusive during the 80s and 90s, Russell spent long days working hard on the claim. Letters from Russell's aging mother marked the passage of time, as she wrote. I can neither read or write in the evening, which makes me feel lonesome as the long winter evenings are approaching. Not meaning to murmur, for I have a pleasant home and good children to care for me, <clears throat> and that is more than many can say. You say the children were calculating to write with you? I should have been delighted to have them done so. But I do not blame them with the thermometer at 100 in the shade. Dear little creatures, how they must suffer to take such long walks in such warm weather. I can hardly be reconciled when I think how far away they are and I shall never see the dear little ones. Oh, how we would like to have you all in our months to spend the winter with us. I think the time would go some quicker, don't you? James and Ellen evaluated their life goals, making the decision to remain in California. And in December of 1889, Russell felt overwhelming grief when he wrote, Received a letter tonight from Will giving an account of Mother's death on Thanksgiving Day. With a burden of grief, Russell continued to work with high hopes, buoyed by picked up a piece of gold weighing three ounces. In 1895, the Mount Democrat wrote of, Russ, uh, of Green Valley, Who says Green Valley is not up to the times? There is a literary society, a spelling school, a dancing school, a baseball team, and a boxing club. What more do they need? <laughs> the paper reported on June 29th. 
Wolf and Russell at Green Valley are making extensive preparations for the 4th of July picnic and a celebration at Meters Grove. A few weeks later, there was a dance held at the Vineyard House attended by the Russell children. The dance was to benefit the Literary Society. The public invitation promised music, with tickets costing $3, and supper was 25 cents a plate, and a good time was assured. The follow-up report in the newspaper said, the hall was fairly well filled and the amount collected more than met extreme expectations. In the early days of the new century, the means of mining had greatly changed. Dredges, or boats as they were called, could be seen dotting the countryside. These gigantic machines promised a quicker and more profitable method to extract the gold. Russell's son hired on with the Natomas Hydraulic Company, working on dredge number five near Folsom. Russell wrote, quite an invention or way to mine. Five months later, the headline of the Sacramento Bee read, Man killed on Natoma dredge, Frank Russell, ground to death by gear wheels. So this is actually the um, coroner's inquest that I have that tells interviews people that were working with him when he died. Russell deeply mourned his son's death. Our dear boy Frank killed last night by being caught in the machinery. The coroner's inquest reported accidental death caused by being caught between the gear and the pinion of the dredger. And what the coroner's um, inquest reflects is that he was working and he had on a, they called it a jumper, a loose jumper, and the jumper got caught in the machinery and oh, it came into the machinery. Oh. <laughs> On January 22, 1916, Russell wrote, Ellen, taken very sick this evening, about 9.30, sent for the doctor at Folsom. <clears throat> January 23rd, Ellen very sick, out of her head at times, and we only hope for the best. Throughout 1916, she remained very sick. And on January 25th, 1917, he wrote, Ellen very bad last night, and the same tonight. God only knows how it will end. Two days later, he wrote, Our dear Ellen passed away today at 12.30 noon, passed to a better home we trust, and now we believe she is with her beloved boy, Frank. Well into his 90s, Russell mourned the loss of his wife and son and continued to take long walks, read his newspaper, visit with family and friends while still prospecting and panning for that elusive gold. At 99 years, he began to wear glasses, and he began to use a walking stick to assist his ambulation as rheumatism was affecting him. He enjoyed reading and rereading his journals, and financially times were very tough. Russell's family provided for him, and in the thank you letter to his daughter Aggie, he wrote, Dear Aggie, your letter in box with contents was received yesterday. I don't know what you did to get so much in the box. On account of my stiff fingers, I don't know if you can make this out. I can't hold a pen. I can hardly read it myself. But I know I will eat well. Tell Hazel not to worry herself for me. I know her money comes hard, as for most of us. We are looking for you up most any time. Remember me to Wally and Willie. Yours truly, Grandpa. As most of the 49ers, were now a vanished breed, Russell became a newsworthy personality as one of the last surviving Gold Rush personalities. He was interviewed in newspapers throughout the state, and it offered the aged miner a chance to recall his early day experiences, and he was called the last of the 40 miners. The Sacramento Star wrote of him, his, own, his home is there at the foot of Pine Hill, a quiet ranch hidden in the trees and brush. The place runs half a mile up Sweetwater Creek, more than 100 men worked that gulch at one time for the elusive gold, he will tell you, and now he alone remains. Ask Russell about the reservoir up the river near the broad hill of Pine Hill. With 21 men, he helped to build that reservoir in the old days, storing up water against the dry season when there was no rain for the running of the sluices. Of those 21 men, he alone is alive. Of those he knew in the early times, there is not one left. Another reporter published Russell's prescription for a long life, writing, Russell ascribes longevity to regular hours and plenty of exercise in the open air. Mr. Russell says he never used tobacco, was never intoxicated, but some of his acquaintances did. And he doesn't remember that it intervened with their living to a ripe old age. 
But I kind of wonder about this because there is a few entries at the beginning when, before he was married and he was living out here that he talks about going out to a dance and then the next day he'll say, feel like a sucked orange. Charles Henry Hahn, another El Dorado County pioneer settler, visited and shared memories of the early days with Russell of the Mount Democrat, Democrat wrote of this visit. There were tears in Russell's eyes when the time came for Hahn's departure. Russell said Hahn was the first one he'd seen in years who could talk with him about the old times. So in the spring of 1930, Russell recorded, put in a very bad night last night. God grant it may be better tonight. And for two days in May, Russell's family prepared for his 100th birthday. And during three days of celebration, over 100 families, friends, strangers, and reporters came to offer their best wishes to the aged man. There were dinners and cakes with 100 candles for the pioneer who remained mentally alert. There were people who came to serenade him. Newspapers throughout the state reported on the long life of the last of the 49er. And it's hard to say if he ever recovered from these birthday celebrations. The next days were spent remaining close to home and trips to the creek became less frequent. On July 16, 1930, his daughter recorded, Grandpa not well. Word began to spread across the foothills about the centurion's failing health. The doctor began to call and friends made one last visit to hear him recall the bygone days. And on July 29th, Russell lay down to take his afternoon nap. And when his daughter checked on him, she found that he had died. She wrote in his journal, Grandpa passed away today, 100 years, 2 months, and 16 days. James is buried with his dear Ellen in Jayhawk Cemetery. So that's a story. It, wow. could, it could be any of your stories if you have relatives that came during the gold rush. Because he did nothing ex, you know, outstanding, wasn't a big person that made a lot of publicity for himself, but he just lived his life. This is actually um, a little book I put together for my family from the journals. I called it a Gold Rush Legacy. And what I did was I just took the journals and then I, I didn't write them word for word, although I had transcribed them. Um, I just took you know different periods and wrote and it kind of, like I said, in the newspapers found articles that would expand the information so it would make it a little more interesting to the fans. You should publish that. <laughs>